welcome back our own Reverend John to the podium. And I know that his encouragement will indeed signal what a wonderful, beautiful world we are all living in. Thank you, Reverend John. Thank you, Reverend Danny. Good morning, family. It's a joy to add my own words of welcome and to be back where I belong, where spirit placed me after drinking from the refreshing waters, that secret place of the Most High. Uh, my encouragement this morning is entitled, He Restoreth My Soul. And I think we all need some soul restoration, don't you? From time to time. So this, this last month has just been wonderful. Uh, a warm welcome uh, on, from a, a balmy Jamaican morning in beautiful Jamaica to all those who listen to us on the World Wide Web. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our hearts, to our beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. This past, the past month has been rest and recreation and recreation and refreshment. And I just wanted to share with you, uh, I don't know if you know of, uh, of uh, Harold S. Kushner, who is the author of a, a book called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. That's one of his books. Um, and he tells the story of a group of tourists uh, on safari in Africa. And he didn't say what country in Africa, but he said they had, they had had several uh, native porters to carry the, their supplies while they trekked. But after three days of, of, of trekking, uh, the porters told the visitors that they would have to stop and rest for a day. It was not that they were tired, they explained, but to quote the lead porter, we have walked too far, too fast, and now we must wait for our souls to catch up with us. Sometimes we just need to stop and wait for our souls to catch up with us. And you know, indigenous people in every culture seem to have known that value of pressing the pause button and, and chilling. Uh, many of us spend a lot of our time pushing, that's all I can say, doing our best to make a living, to be a good parent, to, to be a good partner, uh, to live life. Sometimes we do it so hard that we don't even have time for ourselves, am I right? And then there comes a time when, if we don't push that pause button, we're looking at something they call burnout. So I'm reminded of the story of, of a pastor who stops a prominent member of his congregation in the street and says to him, you, you always seem to be so busy rushing. You know, I, I, I've, I've wanted to talk to you for some while, but you never seem to have the time. What are you rushing about so much for? And the man said, well, pastor, I'm rushing after making a good life for my family. I, I, I'm rushing after success. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a hurry to get to the top of the um, success ladder. So the pastor thought for a moment and said, that sounds like a good uh, motive and a good reason. If the things that you want and the success that you seek are out there running away from you. But what, my friend, if what you seek is behind you trying to catch up with you and never seems to be able to, to catch you, you're never at home when, he, uh, when it comes calling because you're out there chasing what really is inside you. And you know, <laughs> um, Reverend Michael and I, as you know, and Reverend Anna and Carol Charlton work in the prisons. And in the prison, uh, there's a, a, a particular participant in one of our classes. And whenever Reverend Michael and I said anything, anything, altruistic or, you know, spiritual, he would say, uh-huh, frankincense and myrrh, reverend. But what me want is the gold. And, you know, I thought to myself, so many of them in that institution are in there because they've been chasing the gold out there instead of looking for it where it really is, the vein of pure spirit, of beauty, and of life. That, that flows within every single person, if they would only look within. So part of that program for me is helping people to mine that gold that is within them. I spoke about that in, in Park City, in Utah, uh, which 
which was how I began my, um, my holiday, which was lovely. Park City is 8,100 feet above sea level, and it is cool. It's 70 degrees um, in the day, and about 50 at night, and there are fireplaces in the bedrooms, and it's, it's, it's really a ski resort, eh? But in the summer, it's, um, we were there, of course, for the summer months, but you can do all kinds of things, zip lining, you know me? And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was wonderful. And uh, Jennifer Livingston and Dawn Williams were both there with me, and I just want to thank them for um, their support, too. It's wonderful when you are, of speaking to a group of people to look out and see faces that love you and that are nodding encouragement and you know beaming the energy at you that um, gives you the strength to stand up and, and share. So I shared a bit about about uh, the correct the correction ministry with them, and it, it, we had a very novel presentation because there is a. Uh, Practitioner, religious science practitioner with Centers for Spiritual Living. Um, and he, he does a superb impersonation, a takeoff of Ernest Holmes. And so the night that I spoke, I shared the platform with Dr. Dennis Mary Jones and Reverend Makita Pierre McAllister, um, both of whom you, some of you will have, have, have met because they have both spoken here. They send big love for all of the, their Jamaican family at the Temple of Light. And Ernest Holmes introduced each of us to, to make our presentations. And at the end, after we had, we had spoken, um, there was a panel discussion with him when we kind of ca caught him up on what's been happening in the last 100 years since he conceived of this wonderful teaching and shared it. But it was really wonderful. You know the Americans, they take everything to another level. So this, this particular practitioner who does Ernest Holmes does weddings as Ernest Holmes. You, you know, uh, but you know, you, you know, they used to do weddings with Elvis Presley um, impersonators. Well, you can get Ernest Holmes to marry you. I prefer if John Scott marries you, but that's just um, that's just where I am at. <laughs> yes, thank you for those who have been there with me. <laughs> thank you, Nicola. But it it was it was really a wonderful experience, and I'll tell you some more about it as as the weeks go on. There were some very interesting experiences and interesting people that I met, including one woman who cured herself of cancer. But I will, I will tell you that um, on another occasion. Friends, the writers of the Bible regarded the pause that refreshes as so important that in the commandments it prescribes a Sabbath, a day of rest. Some people take this commandment so seriously that they will not lift a finger on the Sabbath. But when Jesus was taken to task for allowing his disciples to walk through the fields and pick fruit and eat it, Jesus said clearly, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, indicating that the Sabbath was given to us as an opportunity to restore our souls, to rest and recreate and refresh. It was not given as a penalty or as a burden. So in the very first book of the Bible, uh, the writer of Exodus, in Exodus 31, verse 13, makes it plain that God himself rested on the seventh day. Now, I can't imagine um, the infinite needing to rest, and there is not a shred of evidence that, that um, the universe has ever ceased for a moment to exist and evolve and unfold. But it's a lovely image. You know, everything he did was so perfect that he sat back and said, ah, let me just rest and, and have a look at this. And I wanted that's not a message for us to sometimes give ourselves a Sabbath and to sit back and look at our lives and look at the blessings that we have and to rest and recreate. Um, in Hebrew, the verbs referring to God's resting and being refreshed uh, Shavat, which means he stopped, and that's what we get the word Sabbath from. And Yinafash, which literally translates as he got his soul back. Can you imagine? God got his soul back by resting and looking at his work. Now, metaphysically, the Sabbath then signifies a state of mind. It is a state of mind that we enter when we get into the silence of our own soul. In other words, into the realm of spirit, or as the beautiful Jesus puts it, when we close the closet door and go within. 
And this is where we find the still waters, and this is where we experience rest and recreation and refreshment and peace. It's where we get our soul back, so to speak. Most conscientious people put their all into work. And we've talked about that. But if you're too busy during the week to even stop and share a meal with your family, um, then maybe on a, you could schedule a little time, family time or together time on a weekend, um, just to invest that, that few, few minutes out of a, a day. I know many people take Sunday as their rest day, but what they do on Sunday is they use the time. They come to church and then they use the rest of the day to catch up on what they didn't do through, during the other days. Am I right? But without regular periods of replenishment, you soon suffer from that burnout I talked about. I have a friend who confessed to me that she has been so busy providing the perfect home, being the perfect wife, the perfect mother, and the perfect professional, that she's experiencing a sense of, I'd use her own words, alienation from God. So I said to her, tell me a little bit about your spiritual practice. She said, that's perfect too, perfectly non-existent. <laughs> So, I, 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 I couldn't help thinking about the prophet Jeremiah, whose comparison between a person who is alienated from the, the God presence, uh, Jeremiah says it's like a tree planted in the desert, which will ultimately wither and die because it, it doesn't have a source of replenishment. But Jeremiah affirms, and I quote, he who trusts the Lord shall be like a tree planted by waters, its leaves are ever fresh. It has no care in a year of drought. It does not cease to bear fruit. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. So let us say together, I am like a tree planted by the waters of truth. Together? I am like a tree planted by the waters of truth. I am firmly rooted in principle. I am firmly rooted in principle. I am invincible. I am invincible. I am not convinced. Let me hear you say, I am invincible. I am invincible. That is the truth. You know, friends, we all know this who, who, are, who have been in this teaching for a while. I want to share it with the visitors as well. I am is really the name of God. And whatever you say after the words I am calls on the very power of the infinite to support you. So you need to give some thought to what you are I aming on yourself. You know, sometimes you say, I'm tired. You know, I'm sick and tired. And the universe says, oh yes, okay, so sick, sick, sick and tired, yeah? Or if you say, I am vibrant and healthy. The Bible said, let the weak say, I am strong. Not because they're feeling strong right now, but that when you say something with enough, enough feeling, when you put your intention on making that your truth, all of life moves to support your decision and your intention. And I have a very dear friend um, who I was just sharing with. I went into prayer about a, a, an issue that she had shared with me. And Spirit said, use an affirmation 108 times a day. And so one of the things I did on my on my holiday was I did 108 affirmations every morning at 6 o'clock and 108 of the same affirmation every evening at 6 o'clock for the entire month of my vacation. It's amazing. And I have a, a, a prayer string, so I just count off. It has 108. They're called a mala, you know, and you, you just count off the beads. But you don't have to be a slave to that. You can just do it in groups of 10 or whatever. But it's very, very centering, and I use that affirmation for the whole month, and I can tell you it's, it's having amazing results. I'm going to use it to fill this temple sanctuary on a Sunday morning as well. 108 times I see a full temple and, and see what, what that does for us. You want to join me in that? It's not an assignment, but just a suggestion. Why don't we affirm that this temple is full to overflowing with seekers of the light and people who, whose hearts seek the, the refreshment and whose souls are catching up with them and saying, you are wonderful, God loves you, and you are where you belong. Yes? 
Can I have an amen? amen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that brings me to your assignment, really. Uh, <laughs> um, I want you to give yourself a Sabbath. You have a two, it's a two-part a, a two um, assignment. The first is really give yourself a Sabbath. And I want to just share with you uh, some points that I got off the internet from a lady who, who um, her, name is, her name is Elizabeth Murphy, who gives some tips. She writes for women, but I think it applies to all of us. Um, some tips for incorporating times of rest and renewal into your, into your life. Murphy says, um, tip number one, admit you need to rest. You don't have to be superhuman. We all need rest and recreation. Admit that you need to rest. There's no shame in being tired because you are serving others. So that's the first thing. It's like when you do 12-step programs, uh, if, you've ever, if you're familiar with them, uh, whether it be Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or whatever it is. Self, one of the steps in the 12-step program is to, first of all, admit that you have a, an issue with something. So admit that you, you need rest. Then put it on your calendar. It doesn't make sense to walk around saying, you know, I really must schedule some time for myself. Actually, put it on the calendar and stick to it. Thirdly, get the support of your family and friends. Share with your partner why you'd like to try to take a personal retreat one day a week. It doesn't have to be a, a, a whole day. It can be half a day, but give yourself some time to rest and refresh and to let your soul catch up with you. And you can ask a prayer partner or a practitioner to pray with you through the process. Don't feel guilty. While it's true that you are leaving behind needs and tasks, the unselfish thing to do is to make it a priority for your own renewal so that when you return to work, you are strengthened for the tasks at hand and you'll find you accomplish even more. Customize your retreat. Think through what is restful for you. Uh, when I take a Sabbath, which is usually a Wednesday on my day off, it doesn't have to be, and it very seldom is, a time of, of deep spirituality, you know. Uh, I may clean my shoes, which I haven't done, you know, take out all the shoes and clean them, or tidy out a cupboard, but I try to do everything on my Sabbath day uh, as, as unto God. I, I, I treat everything as if it's a meditation on a Wednesday. Um, if I meet for friends with coffee, that's part of my Sabbath. It's part of, of, my, of my soul's restoration and refreshment to share with those people that I love. So customize your retreat and um, decide whether you want it rustic or luxurious. Is it going to be active or quiet? Uh, are you going to the mountains or to the sea? Um, do you want to go a long way away or do you just want to, to be near home? Um, Make your Sabbath your own, done for your own pleasure and your own rest and relaxation. And finally, include the nature element. I, I, I strongly believe that, as the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory and are the perfect setting in which for you to be renewed. Uh, in Hebrew, the term for still waters is my menuhot, which means waters of rest and relaxation. Um, it's, it's really a very important aspect of your, your ministry to yourself. And I wanted just, just to tell you one other little story about our, our, our experience in the prison. Um, and it's, it's that one, one class, a few cohorts ago, maybe about a year ago, one of the, of the participants said, So Rev... What's in this for you and Reverend Michael? Are you paid to conduct the program? Oh, he said, no, we're not paid. And he's, he was baffled. He was really genuinely baffled because we weren't preaching or trying to win souls for anything or anyone. And we, he couldn't wrap his mind around the idea that anyone could care about him enough to offer him the opportunity to grow as a person without asking for anything in return. You know, you know people who think, if you say hello, they th wonder, or, or, or what shall come with? What does she want? What does he want? What's the, what's the, the ulterior motive? And so he said, um, 
so, so, so what do you get out of it? And you could see the disbelief in his eyes when we said that all reward was seeing him awaken to his full potential as a human being. Um, you know, it's, but I want you to know that when you, when you give that gift to someone, the gift of just seeing in them the truth of their godness and their goodness, you are refreshing and restoring their soul. So the second part of your assignment is, particularly if you know anyone who has had an experience a loss of any kind, loss of health or a loss of a loved one to, um, if, to death if they're in grieving, or the loss of a partner if there's been a breakup, um, I want you to reach out to them this week. Just phone. Maybe, you know, maybe you've been meaning to, and you, you haven't because you just don't know what to say. You don't need to say anything. Just call and say, I'm here for you, and I'm, I'm, I, you're in my heart, and I'm praying with you. You don't need to say anything more. But reach out, because I can tell you it is in the reaching out to people that we help to restore their souls. We can be the still waters uh, for people who really need someone to, to touch them in a way that is most essential to the, the healing of their humanity and their lives. So reach out, call. Uh, another participant in the program used to brush aside our, 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 our talks, and I shared with, uh, brush aside our affirmations and the things as I was telling you, saying it's frankincense and myrrh. And I shared it in, in Park City, and one of the things that, that came to me as I was sharing it is that I really believe that our classes in this prison program are what are helping to restore the souls of those people who participate. And the word is getting around that community, that this is something which is worthwhile and that is a gift that they should give themselves. And so this last quarter we had, we had a full 20 people, I think Reverend Michael, for, uh, for the entire 12 weeks. Um, Reverend Michael gave them a very, a very powerful image uh, one day because he was saying, you know, you may feel that you're in here for 15 years or 13 or 10 years, and it's a long time. And Michael said, I want you to, to know how long Jesus took to prepare for his ministry. I think it was 13 years Jesus took to prepare himself. And he said, suppose you could think about your time in here as an opportunity to prepare yourself to fulfill your life purpose. And not only to prepare yourself, but you can start doing it now. You could have heard a pin drop in the class because nobody had thought that maybe this experience that they were going through, the valley of the shadow of death, and in there in a pretty me can tell you. And just to see the look on their faces when they, the idea that, yes, something good can come out of this. This can be a period that I use to restore my soul and this reach out to restore the souls of others. It, it was really just very, very emotional for me. One bright young man uh, in another class tried to engage me in a philosophical argument about which day was the correct day for the Sabbath. I said, I'm not here. I told him that we do not quarrel with our brothers and sisters if they insist that the Lord should be worshipped on the seventh day. Instead, we joyfully join them on that day in praising omnipresence. I can praise God any day. And if another person holds it as gospel that the first day is the holy day, they say, me too. We can again acquiesce. For as mental scientists, every day for us is a Sabbath, don't? We can, we can see God and experience God and praise God and live God every single day of our lives. So we see that as the lamp burning within every human heart, in the temple of every human life, and we can pause and refresh and recreate and restore our souls any day we choose. But we need to choose a day and make it a regular spiritual practice. So I want you to just set your intention. A, to give yourself a Sabbath, and B, to reach out to someone and help to refresh their soul. In this consciousness, you will indeed be like a tree planted by the still waters of truth, which continually restore your soul and 
my prayer is that you will know that God is nourishing you and that your leaves will never wither and you will always bear the fruit of truth as you bear, bear witness to your spiritual magnificence. God loves you. Rest and recreate with me. Namaste. Thank you.